I remember the very first time I saw it coming up the stairs in the Museum of Modern Art and seeing that painting for the first time. And I had seen other Van Goghs in other museums in California and things like that. But this one, I remember just bursting into tears, you know, to see a person be able to put himself into the work like that. I'm super passionate about taking your art to the next level, up-leveling your art, as well as your life. How do you do that? How do you go from doing something that's pretty good, getting pretty good results, and even excellent results, but taking it to an amazing, higher place? Well, I read this book last year called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. And in this book, Gay is talking about this transition, I didn't even know there was a transition. I didn't even know this was possible. I mean, when things are pretty good, sometimes you feel like kind of, you know, is it, is it okay to ask for more, you know? But I just had this sense, I just had this feeling that I, I just needed, I think I could get this to even a better place. I touched it. I know in our work, when we're making art, things can feel amazing. Sometimes art can come out so quickly and so powerfully, and, and then other times it can't. What if I could get more? How do we get more in that place? How do we hit those moments and more? But that's what the big leap's all about. He talks about the zone of excellence when things are pretty good, but there's also the zone of genius. And that's something all together different. Gay's a New York Times bestselling author. He's written over more than 40 books, trained thousands of coaches. He's appeared on Oprah and hosted seminars around the around the world. He's got an international learning center. It's it's all about teaching core skills for kind of awareness, um, conscious living, and assisting people in opening up to their creativity, uh, and love, and, and vitality. This is so interesting and so powerful, and I am really excited to share with you a conversation I had with Gay recently. I think you're going to find it really exciting. Welcome to Art to Life, a podcast for the creatively curious. My name is Nicholas Wilton, and each week I'll help you rediscover not just the art of your life, but the art in your life. Join me as we explore that perfect blue at twilight, the wild frontiers of art making and the extraordinary joy of finding your way as you go. Gay, thanks so much for being here. I just want to say that we used your book in my mastermind, my business mastermind, created a big stir for everyone. And um, it was super powerful for me. The reason it was is because I teach artists uh, how to kind of take the big leap in art and how to do this in their creativity. So there was obviously uh, tremendous parallels uh, with what you're teaching and, and you are teaching about optimization of creativity. But I would love to kind of start there where, because I'm just so curious how you think about creativity. And you know, you're, you're speaking in your book about becoming bigger, m- moving to your zone of genius and everything. And creativity is a part of that. But how do you speak about that in, in your work? Yes. Well, I want to not only talk a little bit about how I speak of it in The Big Leap, but also the uh, sequel to The Big Leap is about to come out this uh, coming summer in June called The Genius Zone. So I want to touch on a little bit of the material from uh, that, if we may. How I think of creativity in the broadest sense is creativity is anything that has the capacity to surprise you so that uh, you could be making a new soup Like my wife, in addition to being a genius poet and writer and seminar leader, is also a master chef. And this morning I was watching her assemble some what's going to be artichoke soup. And it's really like watching a symphony 
conduct or work with the different things. It has a flow to it, and uh, she's always coming up with something new. No two recipes are ever the same. And so that's what I mean by having the capacity to surprise you. I've been every morning pretty much for the last 40 years or so. Uh, I'm an early riser. I usually wake up around 4.30 in the morning. And so usually from 5 or 5.30 to 7.30 when my wife gets up, I'm writing. That's my key writing time. And when I'm doing that, I'm just in the zone and things are coming up, but it always has that capacity to take me off in some new direction and and have some word or phrase comes through that makes me go, oh yeah, okay, I wasn't thinking of that before. And so that capacity, to me, wonder and creativity go hand in hand because the capacity to wonder about something, to me, is one of the greatest gifts that human beings have. Yeah. So, you know, when I'm in my coaching and looking at a painting and I get a question, you know, a lot of people are challenged with, well, how do you know when it's done? And how do you even evaluate where you are? Because what you're talking about are internal feelings. But as artists, we're making something that's in front of us. That's it's, it's like this artifact of how we're feeling, you know, so I love it because, you know, People are trying to understand what exactly their, how their feeling affects what they're making. And that's the word that I use. Does it create wonder? And, and it's a, it's a bar, like that's a pretty high bar, but I love it because it keeps you pushing till you actually feel that. And even imagine would somebody coming along, you know, I describe it like if someone's coming home from work one day and they're just busy and they're walking down the sidewalk and they pass a gallery and they look in the window and they they're just amazed and, and they've never seen anything like this. And they're they feel alive looking at it and they would, you know, come home and tell their wife about it. Like, oh, my God, I saw this painting today. You know, that's the kind of wonder. That's the bar. Uh, so I've never heard anyone say, use that word before, but that's exactly the word that I teach. That's a wonderful thing to know. It's a good confirmation for me, too, that a person in a slightly different field than I am uses the same kind of tool. Well, to me, the capacity for wonder is such an important thing because you can't buy it. There's no other way to get it. You just have to make yourself available for it. You have to create a space for it because you can't really predict it in any way. You know, that's what's great about it. It, You don't have that kind of control over it. And so what we can do is do things that make ourselves stand in openness to it. You see, I think also alignment plays a huge role in human life in the following way, that First of all, we need to be aligned with our purpose. What are we really doing here? You know, why am I really here? And with with artistry, you know, my daughter is an artist, and she pretty much from the time she could stand up, all she wanted to do was create art. And for, you know, I remember once giving her when she was in college a microwave oven, and she took one look at it, and I don't think it occurred to her for a minute to make popcorn in it. She said, oh, I see what I can do with this. You know, Uh it was going to become an art piece. And so (laughs) (laughs) um, uh, I'm intimately familiar with how artists think from having (laughs) grown up with one. Because I can remember as early as four years old, I walked into her room while she was busy working on something on the floor, some kind of crayon thing. And she even shushed me. She said, shh, I'm busy. And I remember, wow, you know, here's a four-year-old shushing (laughs) her 30-year-old dad. You know, that's kind of amazing. (laughs) It wasn't necessarily, it didn't make me real happy at the time, but uh, now it makes me happy because I see that it's great to have a life purpose. And she knew what her purpose was from from way back, and she's really never deviated. As a matter of fact, she told me one time that she was never going to get married or have children. And this was when she was reasonably young, you know, uh, when she was a teenager. And I said, why? And she said, basically, because it would interfere with my art work. Wow. And uh, so that that's pretty amazing. So I salute the dedication of anyone who's willing to put their heart and soul on the line for whatever it is. And it doesn't just have to be, I, I hope you'll agree with me, 
um, about this, Nicholas, but it doesn't have to just be a visual art we're talking about. Right. You see, I work with a lot of people in um, the entertainment world. I live near, you know, 90 minutes away from Hollywood. So I, I work with a lot of actors and musicians and folks like that who are taking their next big leap. And it's always the same issue in a way that whether you're cooking a great creative soup or making a great creative album, you've got to go through a gateway usually of fear that gets you down to the good stuff, that oftentimes fear is the thing that creates what I call in the big leap, the upper limit problem, where we keep ourselves limited and keep sabotaging ourselves when things start going better and better and better. And what I tried to do in the big leap was make a roadmap of what those fears are so that people know about them and know what to expect when they uh, accidentally stray into that territory. Yes, no, absolutely. And You know, one of the things that I work with artists on is giving them the tools and the understanding of art making, because lots of people have missing bits of information, um, but there's principles you can use to to sort of correct your art and fix your art and lose control of it and gain control of it. So we can reduce that fear. The fear for artists many times is they get stuck in their art. They like it, but they can't change it. You know, so these these ideas and so having making it possible for them to realize there aren't actually any mistakes. That's like that's something borrowed from other (laughs) categories of life. But in art making, we need these mistakes. We need these corrections and these edits That's what brings the authenticity to the work. You know, it's just it's garden variety, essential to have it. But for somebody thinking about making art and standing on the outside of it, there's this fear. And and I I, it's really the biggest thing that I deal with. And it's so cool to hear you talk about this in terms of, you know, an actor trying to take the next big leap. It's it's being seen, maybe. I mean, I'm not sure what the most commoning, common limiting belief is that you come across. Ours is comparison. Uh, people are self-conscious and they comp- there's some standard they're trying to meet. Well, it boils down in our work to one of just a few big fears. One of them is what I call the fear of outshining in the big leap. It's that fear usually gotten around brothers and sisters when you're a kid about Don't stick your head too much above the rest of everybody. It takes everybody else's light away. Don't shine so much because you make other people feel bad. So that's a big one that often gets confronted. Uh, Probably the biggest one of all, though, and, you know, I've worked with Grammy winners and Oscar winners and folks like that, and even they have some of this in them, is the fear that they are fundamentally flawed in some way deep down inside that nobody but them knows about. The fear that they've done something wrong or are flawed in some way, way down inside, that inability to love that deepest aspect of our wounds inside can really get in the mix uh, when you're trying to shine in your art. Because if you feel that you are fundamentally flawed in some way, then there's a hesitation to go all the way and release your full creative powers. And so that one is a big one for a lot of people. There are a couple of others that bear mention. One of them is the fear of uh, burden in the sense that I've worked with people that were afraid to get bigger and more visible or wealthier or whatever their goal was, they were afraid to get bigger because they were afraid that it would bring a bigger burden with them. Oh, you mean like, uh, why, why would becoming wealthier bring a bigger burden? Because they're already experiencing some burden in where they already are. Ah. And they, they have a mentality that says, if I do more of what I'm already doing, I'm just going to feel more and more burdened. See, when I get in the big leap, I talk about these four zones, the zone of incompetence, the zone of competence, the zone of excellence, and then the, the genius zone. And the biggest trap for probably a lot of folks you and I work with is the excellence zone. They're doing something already they're pretty good at, 
And but you really want them to take that leap into their genius zone where they're bringing forth the yes. what I call the very essence of who they really are and putting that out into their work. Uh, that's what I'm after, too. I don't necessarily work with visual artists, but I, uh, I have worked with a few visual artists, but it's not my main thing. I tend to work nowadays actually more with people at uh, the highest level in business, like CEOs come here looking for that edge. But it doesn't really matter in a way. It doesn't. It doesn't at all. Yeah, yeah. Because like you said earlier, what it's really all about is opening up that capacity for wonder and also being willing to handle and get a conversation going with your fears and limitations. A lot of folks get very defensive, of course, and have glitches about wanting to go down into that zone. But I always say there's nothing down there to fear, really. Uh, I mean, it's all about fear, but you're already functioning in your life, so it's not going to harm you in any way to open up and know more about yourself. But, you know, that's the thing, too. I found that a lot of very creative people have had projected onto them other people's fears at an early age. Yes. That yes. they made other people feel uncomfortable. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> you know, absolutely. As an artist, when I was starting out and I was, you know, I've always been an artist and I've always, I've actually always survived as an artist. And I would share this, that I was making my art and, you know, paying my rent and, and people would be like, wow, you know, like that's the life you're, you're making art and you like doing it and you're, and I wasn't, it was excellent. You know, it was excellent, but it wasn't kind of the level that we're talking about now. And, and because all I got around me was reinforcement that I should just thank my lucky stars that I'm not a starving artist and that, you know, I mean, I pretty much won the lottery. I'm making art and, you know, I was able to send my kids to, you know, we went on vacations and I paid for a house that we eventually bought. And, you know, so that was a challenge for me going, realizing there was room above excellent, you know, like who, who am I to ask for like amazing? Who am I asked to go into a genius level? You know, that that's, that's a thing that I, I really have a lot of artists come into my world and they've been doing this a long time and they're already successful, but they're just, it's just, they they haven't cracked into that top 5%, 10%. And I mean, for themselves. And, and when that happens, then sales explode. Everything opens up, as you can imagine, right? When you're talking to CEOs, what that can do. And so that's what I'm so excited about, what you're teaching and learning for myself better how to just turn that dial. But for me, it was that was a barrier. It was excellent. It seemed like that's good enough. It was, it's way better than my parents had, you know. Well, that's that's a great temptation is to stay in the uh, zone of excellence because there you're making good money oftentimes and you've got a steady thing going and your family likes it. They come to depend on certain things. And so that's a great place to be. And as you've now discovered, it's not the place you want to stop, because if you stop there, it becomes kind of a, a juggernaut towards stagnation in a way, because in developmental psychology, we kind of break it down by decades. And the decade, we say in your 30s, you find your life. In your 40s, you build your life. In your 50s, you enjoy your life. And, and from then on, the task from 50 on especially, and this is really true for creative people, every breath you take is a choice between creativity or stagnation. And the forces of stagnation mount as you get older because often you're in your zone of excellence and you're cranking things out and doing well and, and people have come to depend on you being there. And so there's a fear of jumping off there or jumping out of that into something that is more your genius. But here's where I come in and I say, look, you don't need to buy a sailboat and sail it to Tahiti or live in a cave in Tibet or anything like that. Start doing it 10 minutes a day. Start devoting 10 more minutes a day to what's in your genius zone. So it doesn't have to be a all one gulp kind of thing. Although, you know, some people may want to do it that way, but that's not really necessary. I've considered both of those that you suggest, actually, that the sailboat one is, is still on my list. And so for those listening, um, you know, you've got some amazing prompts in the book and, you know, questions about, you know, this first step into wholeness. 
when you say, you know, take 10 minutes a day and basically you're describing, you know, occupying this present place. I mean, how would you coach that? I mean, how do you describe what that looks like? Well, I'll tell you what we do here. If a CEO comes and chooses to do one of our $20,000 big leap days here, what they get for that is the first thing they, they do is they go in a room by themselves for 10 minutes and simply ask themselves the following wonder question. Hmm, what is it that I most love to do? Hmm, what is it that I most love to do? And spend 10 minutes simply focusing on that because that's a direct line to whatever your genius is. I remember a quote from, um, I'm a music fan, and uh, one time they asked Robert Plant many years ago, why hadn't he ever done a Led Zeppelin reunion? Because it, you know, would brought in hundreds of millions of dollars. And he said, well, I couldn't stand the idea of singing Stairway to Heaven 55 nights in a row. Wow. And so that was worth turning down hundreds of millions of dollars, yeah. not, to, yeah. not to have to do that. And not another starry night, you know, yeah. Exactly. Right. And so I think those of us, especially creative artists, have a real fear of repeating ourselves in a way. We don't want to lose that sense of wonder. We don't want to lose the capacity for surprise. But life pulls us oftentimes into things that cause us to lose that capacity for surprise. And it keeps us locked into doing something over and over again that we've sort of lost heart in. So it's essential to rewake ourselves up. And wherever you are, I, I see people a lot of times anywhere from, I think right now my youngest client is probably 37. Uh, he's a Wall Street wunderkind, and my oldest one is probably 55 right now. So that's generally the group of people that I tend to work with a lot of times. And so the sweet spot of that particular age group is when you're approaching 40, you're getting real calls for your genius. You're getting calls that you better not overlook at your own peril because you're getting messages that say, keep inventing something new. Don't get into a rut here. Keep going, right, keep going. Right. Get more territory. Keep claiming territory. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Then you get up into your 40s and then the job becomes oftentimes a balancing act of opening up to more and handling what you've already got. And, and there again, the temptation is to do more and more and more of what brings in the most money, accolades, at a boys, at a girl kind of things. And that can become a real sticking place. And then, of course, when you get into your 50s, you're in a direct dialogue with mortality itself. And that's one of the great benefits of being in that age group is after the age of 50, you start getting a direct conversation going with what's going to eventually dematerialize you mm -hmm. in yourself. And that can be used as a tremendous awakening of creativity, although if you don't be with it, it can also lead very quickly to despair, further decrepitude of your creativity. So it's a real narrow thing we go through in our 50s, 60s, and up into our 70s. But if you work it right, you get to be 76 and still crazy about life and creating new things every day. Right, exactly. Yeah, I love that. So I... You know, in my programs, uh, I have people work on a desire board. We don't even start making art in, in one of my, my sort of signature course. It's a three month program and we're doing it right now. Actually, people come in thinking they're going to learn color and how to shade and, you know, but we don't do any artwork for several weeks. And we're working on inspiration boards. We're doing desire boards because what I have discovered and and I sort of figured this out for myself, but now I'm going out into the world and talking to neuroscientists and that when people do what lights them up, uh, what brings them alive, they become inspired. And, and when they become inspired, creativity 
how I see it is just a natural reaction. It's just a byproduct of feeling inspired. We are creative. Everyone's creative. This is what we do when we're thriving. It's like the byproduct almost. Is that your experience? Yes, because it's it's whatever you're doing, bringing able to bring that genius to it. As you were speaking, Nicholas, I had a memory of a, a famous sushi chef over in Japan that was talking about his own training. And his own master didn't let him touch a piece of fish for three years, that he worked three years on rice. That was his job for three years. And in three years, you can get a really good conversation going with rice. You know, you can figure out what (laughs) rice is really all about. (laughs) And and so I I think it's, it's brilliant in a way not to pick up the brush the first day, but to kind of create the background for that and and find out what the deep structures of art really are. Because like I say, you work with visual art a lot, but what we work with around here really is the art of life itself. How can you be in that creative flow every moment of every day? Because you want to be, I've found, in that creative flow when you're talking about your family, when you're talking with your kids, when you're talking with uh, your partner. And my wife and I, we kind of think of the flow of love and communication between us as the signature thing that we're after every day, that we want to keep that in a pure state. And so we do everything possible to make sure that that flow continues. And so over 41 years, we've learned a lot about how to do that. And also writing 10 relationship books together, that really helped us uh, learn how to clean out all the uh, things that were in the way of the flow there. Nothing like co-authoring a book with your uh, beloved to bring out the shadow elements of it, of your relationship. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, If you can survive that, you can even survive remodeling a house together, which we did three different times in our relationship. That really put us to the test. That's that's Uh, a higher level. Level. Yeah, that's a whole different thing. Uh, but um, we we learned a great deal from it. But anyway, the point I'm making is that the flow of life energy itself, the flow of creativity itself, whether it's with a beloved in your life or with inside your relationship with your creativity, that flow is sacred and must be Yes. kept alive at all yes. time because that's who you really are. Yes. And I think all of us are artists if we look, you know, I say everybody's a poet and doesn't know it because we're all in the business of opening up to new life all the time and we're either encouraging that and learning with it or we're squelching it at all times. And I'm here to say there's nothing better as a as a way to bathe yourself in life than really opening up and acknowledging yourself as an artist of life who's here to create whatever magic contribution you can bring with you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my whole platform is called Art to Life because what I saw, what became so interesting for me was Yes, I can teach people to mix colors or to paint or draw or sculpt or whatever. But what I saw is you can't make exciting art with a boring life. You know, (laughs) that art making is a is a process is a practice of becoming yourself. That's how I teach art making, that it's an optimization of both. And, And what the remarkable thing is that we see that what's happening in our programs and courses is the the radical changes and amazing serendipity and synchronicities and and breakthroughs and and all kinds of accomplishments and opportunities arise as the work becomes more like them and 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 that's how i describe it. it it's getting very personal with this artwork so i love how you describe it how you you've taken into in a relational with with a partner or, or beloved but this is also with yourself, but for and having a relation or having a relationship with yourself. But when you have the thing you make is also it's like that artifact. It's the visual proof of your progress of there it is again. Here it comes. There, There's where there's where I wa- was a year ago. Now here's where I am. It's remarkable. It is remarkable. And there's never a dull moment once you take on life itself as the painting that you're doing at all times that I have actually you mentioned Starry Night that's one of two of my favorite paintings and whenever I go to New York 
I don't know how many dozens of times I've done this, but as soon as my feet hit the pavement, I make a pilgrimage to the Met to see a Rembrandt self-portrait that hangs there. And the first time I saw it, way back, probably, I don't know, probably when I was in my 20s, I burst into tears when I saw it because I could see, I think, what you're talking about, about art and life, because in order to do this self-portrait, he had to take such a merciless look at himself, you know, to not improve anything yeah, that was yeah. in his face. And that becomes the genius, the ability to look and see the depths of it. And I've been back to see that painting many, many, many times and have have it in books and everything like that, but it never fails to move me. I can just sit there. Fortunately, I have a bench and I sit there and just be with that painting for a long time. And also Starry Night has that effect on me too. I remember the very first time I saw it coming up the stairs in the Museum of Modern Art and seeing that painting for the first time. And I had seen other Van Goghs in other museums in California and things like that. But this one, I remember just bursting into tears, you know, to see a person be able to put himself into the work like that. You know, you could see his actual processes, (laughs) the way his brain was working and and what he was seeing. And I had the great privilege once of... uh, accompanying um, a colleague, an elder colleague of mine, Alice Miller, the great psychologist Alice Miller, who lives nearby where all those paintings were made in the mental hospital there. And she took me around to different places where he stood to make those paintings. And I got to stand in the very place that Van Gogh had had painted those crows and those fields of... uh, Really? Just like on the side of the road where he, you know... Painted. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, it was very wow. magical. And Alice has passed on now, but I'll always remember that magical day. And also because one of those uh, Provençal winds was blowing at about 80 miles an hour, and Alice <laughs> weighs about 90 pounds, and she was all she could do to hang on to my arm as we were going right. around. <laughs> you know, one of the things with creativity that I think it puts us in the driver's seat of our life or that we are experiencing wonder is that it brings us into presence. And in reading your book, something popped out at me that I had not really ever put the connection so clearly as you wrote it, but it's this idea that there's, that your ego drops away, that the ego is so, I mean, the ego is what I'm fighting with so many people who are, I'm trying to help get their art improved. They're self-conscious. They're not good enough. A lot of the limiting beliefs you're sharing, but it really isn't welcome in the present moment when you can really drop in. And I never really thought about it that way. I mean, I know, I know the power of just being in the moment. And I'm, I'm excited to talk about the time and all of that, but, you know, really dropping in and I call it a flow state. But could you talk a bit more about that? I, I love that idea about ego and where is it gone? Where did it go? And, and why isn't it in the, in the moment? Because when that leaves, we have an opportunity. Well, this happens to be what I'm very interested in right now. You've touched the mother load here because that's what the new book is all about. The Genius Zone is all about. Oh, my God. I'm so ex- I looked for this new book because Margaret said that there was a new book. So I was scouring for it. And I'm like, it's not here. So no, it's oh, not so here. Uh, it's in June. I believe the official pub date is June 29th. So okay. uh, it'll it'll be around in a few months. But the key thing that's in that book is that I found this particular key that's kind of like your secret back door to the universe that you, <laughs> if you know a certain thing or knew how to do a certain move, I call it the genius move, it opens up that direct relationship with the creative forces in the universe. And so when the book comes out, sit down with it for about an hour. It won't take you more than an hour, uh, but I can kind of point you in the direction now of what to do. The real problem, Nicholas, is that in the ego state, people get lost in trying to control things that they actually have no control over. So (laughs) one person gets locked into a competitive, comparative way of thinking, and they get stuck in that, always comparing themselves to other people or uh, say, hey, I'm better than that. Why does that person get $6,000 for their painting and I had to sell mine for $1,200? You know, all that comparative, competitive thinking is one trap that people get 
into on an ego state. Another trap is the trap of self-referential thinking about not being good enough. So not feeling loved, not feeling wanted, not feeling yeah. valued. Yeah, not uh, feeling all, worthy, you know. Not feeling yeah. worthy. Uh, all of those deep old sinkhole feelings of the ego. Here's where something can really be learned of value. Think of yourself as having two personalities when you start learning how to be in the world. One personality, I call personality number one, is your outgoing part, your way of connecting with other people. But if you grow up in a situation where that doesn't work very well, where positive things don't get rewarded very well, then you turn to personality number two, which is, I'll give you an example. I was, I was in a supermarket once and I was watching mom and a boy that was probably two years old sitting in the, in the push cart. And I happened to be on the same aisle and I heard the little boy said, mommy, can we have some cookies? And mom didn't respond and she was busy doing something else and he said a little louder mom can we get some cookies and again she kind of paid attention but not really and then he went into personality number two "Ah, i want a cookie i want a cookie i want a cookie and that's when he got the cookies so Ah. that's how personality two sometimes it works (laughs) and so uh, we get locked into negative ways of going after what we need rather than positive ways that work in uh, situations. So we develop this positive personality and then this protect us from pain personality that I call personality number two. And so if you think of just about everything you do fitting into one of those two personalities, those get a big grip on us. And here's the thing. Creativity does not happen while we're engaged in those kind of activities of the ego. You can only go a certain way with ego-based activities. So at a certain point, you have to go beyond that and go either down through the pain of the old number two personality or go up through the positive aspects of the number one personality and realize, well, in a way, that doesn't serve me either because that's just me looking good for the public. Where I need to get to as an artist is beyond my ego, beyond personality number one and number two, beyond praise and blame to that point where I'm down in the sweet spot of my own essential creativity and letting that blossom through me in the way that no other person can on earth can bring it through. You get lost in the wonder. You know, I have people talking about that come and they're really stuck and they can't, things aren't going well and they're not selling their work. And, and I often ask them, you know, well, when was the last time you worked, you, you made art? And they're like, well, I, you know, I just, I've hit a, a dry spell. And, and there's always a relationship between how bad someone feels and how far away from actually making their art they are. Because the process of making art is not at all when you're actually in it. Like if you're making art and you're thinking about, you know, how you need to be better or you're thinking about how you're not worthy, you're actually not making art. The art making, worrying about it and worrying about what might happen or what might not happen or what didn't happen or that's not at all art making and so i think that's what you're talking about you know it's like it transcends both those states the low level one as well as the the high one that you're you know the the star yeah and both of those places have their traps to them you know in in zen uh, philosophy they say no praise no blame that where you're going for is is a place that's beyond praise and blame And I think true creativity happens in that sweet spot. I wanted to give a little bit of the um, work that I I start touching on. I remember uh, in Genius Zone, I kind of give this key to to this little special door you can go through. It has a lot to do with learning how to stop controlling, stop trying to control things that you don't have any control over. Like, for example... A lot of people get lost in thinking about what other people think about them. And that's a classic example of something that you don't have any control over whatsoever. But a lot of people get so lost in that 
that they actually start taking those thoughts seriously. And <laughs> yeah. there goes the whole you know, beginning of projecting something onto another person. And so where we need to get to with that is to realize that it's like Winston Churchill said, you know, when I was 20, I was very concerned with what other people thought of me. When I was 40, I became less concerned about what they thought of me. When I was 60, I realized they weren't thinking of me anyway. Yeah. And uh, that letting go of control of what other people think of you is a really significant thing, I think, for creative people. And that's not to say you shouldn't receive feedback in an open-hearted way and that kind of thing, but a lot of us get too lost in that mentally about considerations of other people. So I think there's a delicate line there to walk for artists and creative people. And a second thing is I think that what art is all about a lot of times is about, just like in the world of business, a lot of the CEO types that I work with, it's about finding that edge, that part of themselves that's wild and free and completely unhindered by convention. And you see it like I'll get a 60-year-old CEO here that's worth $100 million and he's been elected president of everything. <laughs> and, you know, I've had these guys, they say, I'm thinking to, a, to f moving to a foreign country so people won't honor me as much. So I won't get invited to as many functions, you know. And so there's this urge inside. That's extreme. But there's an urge inside each of us to preserve that wild part of ourselves that's directly plugged into the creative flow of the universe. Because even if you, you're a $100 million CEO, you know that there's a part of you inside that needs to be tickled that's not being tickled. Yes. Yeah. And, in the, and I think in the new book, I use this quote from the Gospel of Thomas, one of the apocryphal Gospels, which says, if you bring forth what is within you, what is within you will save you. You know, that we all have this spark of essence inside ourselves that we need to bring forth from within us. And, you know, you're in the visual arts end of things, but we're all talking about the same thing, which yes, is really yes. becoming an artist of life. Exactly. Yes. Becoming alive. You know, what, what brings you alive? Uh, absolutely. So those examples you're giving of just the little reframes. I mean, is that what the book, uh, I mean, you said there's like this back door kind of these, these are the keys to that, or is there one primary idea there? Well, one primary idea is look for the places. And I show you in the book how to figure out where they are. That's going to take you an hour. So I can't really digest that in five minutes. But what you do is you find a way to notice, a very easy way to notice, your body will tell you when you're trying to control something that's not within your power to control. Yes, you're right. And once you learn to spot that, it's kind of like learning how to spot whether you're really hungry or not. You know, there's a certain feeling that lets you know that you're actually hungry compared to maybe you saw an ad for yeah. the new dollar and 39 cent super chocolate bar or something like that uh, just a few minutes ago. And that's what you're hungry for. But that's an energy. I mean, a, a, a picture that's been implanted in your mind from TV or a sound from, from radio. So that's different from the actual experience. Well, once you learn how to detect this actual experience that you're trying to control the uncontrollable, you have a way of letting go of that control. And that's when you're speaking directly to the creative forces of the universe. And once you get good at doing that, it's kind of like riding a bike. You never forget how to do that. Yes. Uh, that's the reason I want you to, when you get the book, sit down for it and devote yourself, turn off everything else and give yourself that hour of training. What's so interesting, Gay, is, and I just did a demonstration for this for some artists where, so when you're making art, you're going between those modes. You're going between like thinking about how this looks and then feeling. And it's really this dance between both. I mean, it really is. And being able to completely let go and not have any control and let intuition come in and then come out and kind of ascertain whether you like it or not, you know, and then do changes and then go back in. It's this interplay between it. But it's it's I mean, I was just painting last night and it's especially in the beginning, you could just letting go 
utterly. What does that look like? I mean, wild is such a good word uh, for it. And, I, and, and it's just, it's what everyone's craving. I mean, you're absolutely right. Everyone's walking around the planet wanting to feel alive. And, and partly that's why people buy art, because they can't make this cool thing. It's not like them, but they're excited because it shows, you know, it's like your daughter's work. Nobody can make that. It's her thing. And it becomes super juicy for other people to like take it and put it in their bedroom, you know. Exactly. Well, I think every artist's dream, whether you're in that kind of art or whatever art yeah. is to capture that space of originality where that dialogue is going on with that original place in themselves. And that's the why probably of makes why so many people get into art and that, um, you know, to keep that alive. Yeah. And to me, that, that's sacred territory and blessings to anyone who operates in that territory. Because to me, if you know, I've been around the world now thirty some times teaching our seminars over the past forty years, and wow. especially relationship seminars. And wherever I go, you know, certainly poverty and things like that. But I think the more universal problem is that people don't feel like they have an opportunity to be creative. People feel like their their creativity won't ever be acknowledged and won't ever be celebrated. And Boy, that's such a dangerous feeling because I've been there, you know, I, I've I've felt that way. And then I experienced how to rebirth all of that way back and and how to keep rebirthing it every day. And I I feel so much of that world pain that goes into not being able to bring forth our creativity. And I want to do something about that. And I know you do, too. So uh, and blessings to anyone who does. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, I try to describe it, you know, people who are actually artists, but they're seriously asking me a question that is this actually available for me? Like, do you think like, I'm not sure I th that I'm eligible for this? And, and to me, and I try and describe it like, it's like someone saying, you know, I'm not sure I can laugh. I mean, other people can laugh and they're very good at it, but I just, I don't know. You know, it's like, I just, I'm, it, and it's like, no, you come with creativity. It's hardwired into you. And it just, it's so great. And I know you live off this as I do to see people kind of acquire this understanding that this is possible for them. And when they do, oh my God, whatever they do, whether it's making a soup or, or a relationship or art, it, it just, uh, it just kind of explodes, and it's awesome to experience that. It's so cool to watch it. It's amazing, and it's a giant experiment that we're engaged in. That, <laughs> yeah. You know, if you go back long enough, you go back, say, 50 million years ago when we were first flopping around on, on Earth trying to figure out how to walk and how far we've come to being now one of eight or nine million different species here on this planet and happening to land in the one that can have a conversation like this, uh, it's a pretty amazing thing. So I, I want to salute the creativity that's already gotten us here. Right on, right on. Well, listen, Gabe, thank you so much for spending your time. I, for one, am totally excited about this book, uh, this new one coming out. And, uh, and it, it makes sense. Like your book left me with a, a question mark a little bit around what you're doing this new book it, it's, it's absolutely what i want to learn so uh thank you for all you do in the world it's, a, it's amazing and it's super inspiring for me and i now i know uh, a lot of artists will feel the same so thank you hey thanks for listening to the art to life show if you enjoyed the podcast please help me get the word out by sharing it with your friends on instagram at art to life underscore world the recording of this and all episodes, along with a place to leave comments, see additional photos, and discover a whole new approach to making art, can be found by going to arttolifepodcast.com. And secondly, if you could leave a rating and review in whatever app you're listening on today, I would super, super appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And last but not least, before you go, if you'd like to be on my artist list, every Sunday morning I send out a video blog all about art making. Go to arttolifepodcast.com to sign up. And all these links are in the show notes, of course. Thanks so much for being here, and we'll see you next week. Bye.